Hey everybody, welcome to Leon's Chainsaw Parts and Repair. I get a lot of questions uh, on kind of where do you start with a saw? You get one, say you buy it on eBay or yard sale or whatever, where do you start? What, uh, how do you diagnose, see what it needs? And I've got some pretty basic stuff that I like to do. You got to remember that a chainsaw, like any other uh, internal combustion engine, needs three basic things to run. You need fuel, you need air, you need spark. If you got those three things, odds are really good, you're going to be able to get it running. Now, you could have some bad crank seals that, you know, won't let you tune it right. You could have an air leak somewhere else. You could have problems in your carburetor that prevent you from getting enough fuel and you could have a timing issue that means the spark fires at the wrong time but in general if you've got those three things covered you're well on your way so we're going to look at a super xl that alan sent me worked on a few of uh, his other saws or, excuse me super easy i'll get it right one of these days folks now, Alan is smart. He shipped me enough saws that he knows that a smaller box is going to save him some money. So he took the, the handlebar off and included it in the box here. Very smart way to go. If you're going to ship me a saw to repair, or ship a saw in general, whether you know, no matter who it's to, you're going to want to do that. Make it as compact as reasonable that you think you can ship it and not have it get damaged. I will say that UPS has got a great track record with me on saws and prices. Post office is so-so. I tend to see their boxes jam damaged and kind of jammed in on themselves a little bit more. So take that for what it is. All right, so we're going to assume, yep, that's the hardware for the handle. All right. So I've got a super easy I know nothing about. A few clues. These don't are, aren't hard and fast rules, but a few clues as to some things that are going on. Or not going on. Now it's in the off position, and the spark plug is in and is not tight. Alright. Somebody has had the plug out. Now whether it's been tested for spark or not, I don't know for certain, but I tend to find that saws with a bad coil, for whatever reason, you're going to get the switch in the on position with the loose spark plug. I don't know. I don't know why. So let's just test the spark on this thing. Now I'm not going to use the plug. I'm going to use my wherever I left it. Maybe. Uh, there we go. We're going to use the bigger spark tester here. Because if it'll jump that gap, it we know that it's good. So let me get you zoomed in. And I'll tilt this a little. Oop, didn't go. There we go. So now you guys are looking at that. You know, I swear, I wish this camera tripod had splines that were just well about twice as many splines would be nice all right hopefully that's going to be good enough i'll twist this around make sure everything's still in frame all right you guys can see that actually got great spark so that's a great sign you can hear it popping as much as you can see it all right so we got good spark there's one of our three right there so let's do some other diagnosis put the spark plug back in so that when I get this thing hosed off we don't fill the cylinder full of water it's not terminal, but you sure don't want to do it if you can avoid it. Okay, 
So we've got spark. How about compression? Feels like great compression to me. We'll put a gauge on it just for the fun of it. And I'm going to guess that we're going to get around 155 pounds of compression. That's pretty good. Yeah, I'll stick with my first guess. 155. We'll see what she comes out at. Now there's a lot of theories on how to get the maximum number. And most most people will open the throttle to wide open when doing a compression test. And you probably get your truest sense of the compression if you do it when it's warm after the saw has been run. Well, I don't have that luxury. So we're going to settle for, maybe we will. That was one thing Home Light did on these damn super EZs that was just irritating beyond all belief is where the spark plug is located. It's hard to get a straight line with a wrench or anything. And as we've discussed before, we don't want to strip out the plug thread. So I'm going to give this... I'm going to leave the throttle choke open, throttle closed. I can't use the fast idle because then that triggers the compression release. That's no good. I'm going to give this five good pulls. Okay, I was off a little bit. Looks like we're sitting at about 145. More than enough to run. These are a high compression saw. A brand new one from the factory could push out as high as 180, but 145 is in no way a worn out saw. And not knowing how long it's been since this one was run, the rings could be fairly dry. Now, looking through the cylinder, I think I still see a little bit of oil in there. But not much. So anyway, plenty of compression. This cover's taking a hit, but that's not going to impact it running. When I opened the saw, the box up, I saw oil around the cap. Common problem people suspect is that the cap gasket is bad. It's not. That's not why it's leaking. The duckbill valve that's located underneath this bronze filter is what's gone bad. And I don't care. There could be one tablespoon of oil in here, and with it closed up, somehow it's going to find a way to wick up through here. It never fails. I don't know what it is about these things. But they're super efficient at leaking oil. And there you go. You can see down in the hole, maybe, a bunch of black goo. Duckbill valve is shut, so I'm just going to leave that loose. Now, now. Yeah, I'm going to put it back on here. It's tight enough. It's not going to fall in. I do want to be able to hose this off. Now, based on that, it's very reasonable to assume that the duckbill valve that's hidden behind this filter and the fuel cap is bad too and when you see an accumulation of kind of blackish around here that's usually a pretty good sign that it's gone bad so we're going to need to pop that out and replace that duct bill too the cap is off so why not take a look at the fuel hose now it's flexible and that's a great start that filter is not original but it's perfectly adequate for this Again, the hose is flexible, and it's not cracking, so it could be in, in pretty good shape. Take a look at the clutch real quick. Okay, so this has the later three-shoe clutch on it. 
That's the most recent style that was used on these. The UT tag is gone, so I can't tell you what year this is, but looking at all of this, I would guess mid to late 70s, and whether or not there's a blue coil under here would dial it in a little bit more. But what we're looking for is just abnormal wear. The clutch drum is in great shape. You see there's next to no wear on the, the splines. Excuse me. But the drum itself, the drum bearing is partially seized. Because you see I'm actually turning the clutch with this. Now lots of times this is just a case of it had been hosed off or sat out. If you spray right above the thrust washer, the little, little WD-40 or your favorite lube, and let it work down in there, see if she loosens up. Now I'm turning back because it, the starter rope is holding it. Okay, now that is still rougher than a cob. All right. Well, because that bearing hasn't loosened up already, we're gonna be pulling the clutch and checking that out for sure. So, let's just take a look at the carburetor. tell a lot by how the air filter looks. This one's dirty, but it was originally black, so it's not horribly filthy. What we do see is that the grommet is gone here. This was not sealing properly. And I've seen a lot worse, but you see all the debris that's down in here. It was leaking sawdust and crud and getting into this air chamber, so it could ingest something bad. Now we know that the uh, carburetor's been off recently, or at least sometime in its life, and we know that by the wire that's being used to hold the choke rod in place there. I don't know if the video is going to focus, but the original cotter pin is gone, and somebody braided some strands of wire, just regular copper wire to hold the choke rod on. So this thing may have had a carb kit by the last owner. Uh, who knows, maybe it's gonna start and run. I wanna take a quick peek at what's under the cover here and see, we'll get an idea of the age of the saw based on whether it has a blue coil or not. That's not definitive, because it could have been changed out. But, we shall see. Alright, so we've got a points ignition. It's a Wico system. You're not going to be able to read that in there. But I can tell by the logo, black coil. And it definitely has leaked fuel from somewhere. That's how we got all that accumulation of garbage in there. So this is all going to get cleaned out. And I would say it was from previous. This is a replacement home light hose. And it looks like the grommet was replaced at the same time. Which cured the fuel leak, but they didn't, uh, didn't clean all this junk out. Which I do want to do. But I don't want to do it yet. And the starter rope appears to be garbage as well. It's got a pretty bad chafe right there, and we'll see it's not retracting all the way, so there's not quite enough tension on it. But all in all, we're not we're not finding anything on this saw that is a deal breaker, you know, that's uh, going to be a hindrance to keep it from running, and that's good. That's what you want to find. Okay. 
Okay. So, what we're going to do, we're going to try and run it. Not for long, I just want to see if it'll pop. If it'll fire, see what I mean? You can't even get a regular socket in here, hardly. I mean, it just will slip on if you, if you go at it carefully. That's why the scrunches actually are good to have for this model. But let's go ahead and put a little gas in the tank and we'll just see if she'll pop and fire on her own. That should be enough. Alright, let's cross our fingers. Maybe this won't be a tough repair. Alright, I just saw some fuel spurt right here out of the carb. Alright, now she's not going to run. That's way too much fuel. You heard it try. But I think it's flooded. That's a lot of fuel. Yeah, she's flooded. Okay. See all the wet in there now? I think it's a safe bet that the last person that worked on the carb had a kit that either had the too tall nub on it or the metering, the fuel inlet lever spring is set a little too high. We'll confirm that real quick. Well, maybe not real quick. Nothing goes super fast on a super easy. Because there's not a lot of room to work in these carb chambers. Alright, we're going to pull this. Wow. That's almost a, a shame to... That was a work of art. Let's say that. Also, a pain in the neck. There we go. We will replace that with a proper... Oh, yeah. We're going to actually have to replace the choker rod. See, see how that hole's been augged way the hell out? Proper cotter pin would just slip right through that. Alright, let's get the fuel hose off. One tip when you uh, have gassed a saw like I did, and then you're going to work on the carburetor, loosen the fuel cap so that the tank's not pressurized and you don't get a big flood of fuel back in here. Most home light saws use a 5 16 wrench for their uh, mounting screws, or at least the old ones up through, say, the mid 90s maybe. So you're going to need a box. And more commonly, open end 5 16 wrench in here. These screws weren't super hard. And so, in a lot of cases, the heads have started to round. And a, a 12 point like this is going to slip, whereas if you can get on with two good sides, it's not going to slip. These don't look terrible. In fact, they look pretty good. So, that's always a plus. Now on the choke side, if you have good a good screw head, you can reach in with a flat blade and unscrew it a little quicker once it's been broken loose. A little quicker than having to do it with my finger. Again, if you've got smaller hands than I do, it fit in here a little easier. 
pop this gasket loose. There we go. And slide the curb to the side, clear the grommets, and then you bring in that contortion of getting it up to where the screws will fall out, and then you can rotate it off. So, let's take a look-see and see if my theory is right. Actually, we'll do this the real right way. Let's pressure test this car. As if it's either of the things that I thought, we should get some bleed off awful fast, like instantaneous. do. Well, that was interesting. That's actually holding a lot better than I thought. That should run based on that. But it certainly flooded awful quick. interesting. Well, we've already got it apart. We're going to check it. Let me bring the camera a little closer and we'll do that routine. in frame. All right. So I like to start with the the inlet lever side over here. That's where I typically find the vast majority of the problems. I would recommend when you're going into one of these carbs, you get a piece of paper out like this and get away from the edge of your bench so you don't accidentally drop something. Our edge. There we go. Okay. That doesn't look too unpliable. Carefully peel this. Yep, she's full of fuel. And that should be should be adequate movement. Take a look at the circuit plate underneath and the gasket. It's probably the most common thing I find on these saws in that when it's a carburetor issue where it doesn't work after a rebuild kit's been installed is that the uh, wrong circuit plate gasket was used. Now there is a spring under here so you want to be careful that you don't get carried away when you're breaking this loose. So far, so good. That is the correct circuit plate gasket. You can see the continuous channel right through here. So, nothing is sticking out. It's obviously bad in here. I don't see a bunch of old gasket residue. That all looks good. All right, let's check the other side. So far, right. We are missing the, <clears throat> the proper screen to keep garbage out of the needle and seat there. Yeah, I'm gonna blow that out with a little compressed air. Oh hell, I can see through it. No need to. 
it is fine. But I do want to get a screen in there before we reassemble this. And getting this press down in there without it distorting and going to one side is actually more trouble than you would think it is. So I like to get a socket. And that's not quite it. A socket that will fit the hole fairly tightly, but not, you gotta leave room for the screen. So that'll work. And it comes halfway pre-molded. So if you get it to stay on there, oops. See if she'll go down in there. That actually went in nicely. I've fought with these a lot longer than that before. You want the screen tight against the wall, the carb, so nothing can slip by. That's to keep random pieces of fuel filter or sawdust or whatever other gobbledygook. And yes, that's a technical term, at least in my shop. All right, let's check this. Those flappers are fairly pliable. I'm not seeing any reason for that not to run. Now these do have index holes, so there's only one proper way for the gaskets to go in and go on. I'm left very, very curious though as to why this thing flooded out that quickly. Normally, we'd have found something already. The one, I mean, it's technically possible that, that that check valve is bad. We'll check it. Now, the kits that you can get from Walbro or Homelight for that little check valve are, uh, they're a complete thing where you pop this entire brass housing out. I'm not going to do that because I'm not convinced it's bad. I'm going to pop the snap ring off and try and get that damn screen to come out. Oh, she's so close. Come on, baby. Come on. It's got a little, little fuel on it that's retaining it down in there nicely. I don't want to distort it if I can... Oh, oh, close. There we go. Okay. Get out of there. Okay. Now where did that crap come from? There's a little goo in there. Could have been old gasket debris. I'm not sure what it was. So that check valve, you can see there's a little diaphragm down in there, and it's in great shape. The original black ones, when they go bad, you can tell because they're either gooed up, completely missing, or stiff as a board but distorted. This is laying flat, and that's a newer type material, so that check valve is fine. And that's why I didn't go crazy with this. I want to reuse it. So those check valve kits have gotten harder to come by. And why waste 10 bucks? You don't need to waste 10 bucks. So it looks like I took us on a wild goose chase down in this carburetor. At least at this point, I haven't found anything to explain why she didn't go. So the snap ring, you just want to get it back in there to retain that screen. And you got to be careful doing this. Take a steady hand so you don't puncture that screen. So that's all it takes right there. Now, we're going to 
assemble this under pressure eventually, but not this part. That gasket looks just fine. Good sealing. There's not even any corrosion in here. I've had these where the, uh, the circuit plate has rust and crap all over in there. And if you see that, you want to peel your gasket. You're going to end up sacrificing it, but clean all that rust and trash out. You don't want that stuff in your carburetor. So you want to take your spring and set it in its recess right there. And this is a non-captured arm. So you got to kind of get it up so that it's pivoting on the axle and then hold it in place with your finger. Just like that. And you're going to take your needle and slip it in and carefully set her down in place. Now I made that look easy because I've done it a lot of times and I'll be honest with you this time I got a little bit lucky. I've had those fall and do something stupid more times than I can count. Before you tighten these screws down you just want to make sure that your spring is lined up on the on the arm. Uh, there's no way in hell I'm going to get the camera to focus real well at that close but there's the divot here and the spring needs to wrap around that. You should have about that much movement so the spring doesn't want to be cocked off sideways. Don't try and reset it. If it goes sideways just take the damn cover back off and, and reset it properly. But once you're sure it's right, tighten this down good. You want that gasket to make a good seal. But remember they're small screws. You don't want to take an impact gun to it. All right, at this point, I want to inspect our movement here. Now, typically, you want this needle set so that it's basically level, or the, excuse me, the arm set so that it's level with the deck height. This one's set a little bit low, so I'm going to just bend it a smidge. And I'll tell you what, that spring slipped out of place. When I uh, when I bent that, now, I was able to get it back in there because I was lucky. Now, I can see it's moving that needle off the seat significantly, so that should be enough to allow good fuel flow. If you got the tools to do it, I like to assemble this part under pressure. So if you get your, your tool out and pump it up. Again, I like to go a little bit, we're at 12, well, 11, and you can see it is slowly bleeding down. Now, it's not bleeding fast enough for me to really get concerned, but we'll see what it does when we start tightening this cover down. So lay your diaphragm in place and set your cover on. Now, if you get that needle set too high, this will be quick enough. Or doing this, you'll you'll know immediately because it'll already be bleeding off. Other times, you don't notice until you've totally tightened the screws down, and then all of a sudden, the needle will accelerate its movement. It is moving a little faster than I typically care for, but a lot of these HDCs, they'll do that. They'll bleed down to the somewhere between four and six, and then it's super slow from there. And that's acceptable. I haven't noticed any detriment to the way the saw runs or the ability to start it. All right, so if I had had that set too high, this needle would have taken off at some point as I was tightening these down. So we're set. And you can also look through the vent hole here. And if the rivet on the diaphragm is not touching this housing, you're also good. Now this one's just a little tiny bit low still, but it should not be an issue. This thing should have run. And I'm a little confused as to why it didn't. So, let's put the damn carburetor back on. Let me zoom this out. That might actually work. Obviously, there's still some...
cleanup that needs to be done here, but I do want to know why this saw didn't run right. We heard it fire once, and it sure acted like it was flooded. So getting it back on is just the reverse. Getting it off. Get my little adapter hose off of here. Oop, wrong direction. Now the gasket stayed in place completely, which is the best case scenario. And there's no no residue of ripped gasket on the carbs, so this will reseal. We can reuse that, no problem. So a slipper into place. Come on. Mm, cantankerous little. There we go. And then you just kind of rotate it down and into place. You want to index your your adjustment screws through the grommet carefully they should slide in pretty easy like that if it starts pushing the grommet out stop and figure out what's wrong and when you can start the screws by hand get them started now again if the gasket is brand new and loose this is a little tougher you're going to spend some time on this and you may have to use a tool a hook tool like this to lift one end of the gasket into place because it i find that it always falls off the screws, especially with the the angle of the carburetor being slightly back like this, the screws like to fall back as well. Okay, I am curious as to why we didn't get this thing to fire off and run. I really expected to see something monumental in that carb with how much gas it spit back. Now, the funny part is I'm putting this on there's a chance I'll have to take it back off again if there's a problem with the reed valves. That can cause spit back like that. But I'll be honest with you, the number of damaged reed valves I've had to replace has been pretty slim. I'd say it's about one out of every she's 40 saws. Just don't find damage on these that often. And sometimes they get replaced just out of caution, and they really aren't bad. Okay, same thing. You don't have to get crazy with these. Once you got a good seal, stop. Let's put our fuel hose back on. That must have been as far as it went originally, at least with this hose which is enough. All right. Well, let's find out what the spark plug looks like after that little soiree. The outside, the plug doesn't look that old. DJ7Y. Alright, we don't want a resistor plug. And we don't want a DJ7Y in there. We want the DJ6J. One heat range cooler. And it's not a projected tip. Originally, the Super 2s didn't use a projected tip either, and later on they started using one, and I'll be honest, I still stick with the non-projected. It just gives you that clearance to the piston, and again, I have personally never noticed any runnability issues. I'm sure somebody out there will say that there are some, and yeah, maybe it's true, but not that I've noticed. All right. That thing ought to run. And if it was flooded, 
it ought to run right away. I'm going to laugh if I gave up just a little too early last time. See if we can get some fuel to come out of the back of the carb again. Interesting. Ah, there we go. Low side was a little too closed off. That's part of why it took a little more time to prime there. But that's idling good. We did the tip test. Didn't change, so I think the crank seals are fine. That sprocket bearing is just stubborn as hell. I don't know what's going on in there. Okay. So obviously this was a, the start of a repair for uh, Alan and damn near the end of it. This isn't going to take a whole lot more to get this thing going, but I do want to clean up all the gobbledygook inside the engine, get the starter housing off and clean that out. All that oily sawdust reduces the amount of heat that can transfer off of the engine and be, you know, blown out with fresh air. Sawdust and oil are going to retain the heat more, which will make the saw run hotter than it should. So we're going to get that all cleaned up, do some duckbill valves, sprocket bearing clean all this out we'll put a new uh, new grommet in the air filter once it's cleaned up already got the spark plug dealt with yeah this isn't gonna be a tough one this will be another good saw for Alan so again that's kind of the process I use it's a process of elimination using logical deduction now I'm not convinced I needed to go into that curb but I'm glad I did because I've eliminated pretty much any any suspicion of a problem in there and it gave you guys some good uh, good top-down view of kind of what those carbs look like I know in the past I haven't gotten as detailed on those as maybe I could have but uh, saw came out of the box I didn't really know what was wrong with it we eliminated spark almost immediately compression immediately and once we got some fuel flowing to it she went so again follow those principles if you've got spark you got to get some air and some fuel to it and these fuel systems are super simple a filter to a hose to a carburetor and into the engine that's it that's all there is to it just as you're diagnosing a saw you've got to logically take a step at a time and figure out what if anything is wrong